evening. Welcome, and thank you all for coming. Um, a few points of housekeeping before I turn it over. Um, anyone who would like to use our hearing loop, there is a hearing loop in this room, and you need only to turn your hearing aid to T coil, and you will have everything that the speaker says amplified for you. Please, could everyone take this opportunity to silence their phones? And before I welcome Susie Solomon to come up and introduce us to our speaker, um, thank you all so much for coming. <coughs> New Canaan Library is all about sharing ideas, exchanging ideas, and we are so thrilled to have this year's Stoddard Lecture tonight here in our room. Susie, would you like to come up and do the introduction? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I am Susie Salomon, co-chair with Judy Dunn of the Pat and Hud Stoddard Art Lecture Committee. And tonight, we welcome you to our third annual uh, uh, lecture. Um, and I know you're going to enjoy it. From John Zinser's talk a year ago on the 21st century art scene, we're hurtling back in time and across the globe to the sixth century of the Byzantine Empire. To help us fully appreciate this journey, we welcome Dr. Helen Evans, the Mary and Michael Jaharis Curator of Byzantine Art at the Metropolitan Museum and the Chief Curator of the New Islamic Wing. Helen is a curator, researcher, and author who received her BA from Tulane University and a master's and PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. Having been involved at the Met since 1986, when she began as a fellow in the Department of Medieval Art, Helen was named curator of that department in 1999 by Philippe de Montebello. In 2012, she opened the Islamic wing of the museum with the exhibition entitled Byzantium and Islam, Age of Transition, a subject she will speak to us about this evening. It is now our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Helen Evans to the New Canaan Library. I appreciate that wonderful introduction, and I would love to be Sheila Canby, who is the head of the Islamic Department at the Met, but I am the expert at the museum on Byzantium, and Byzantium and Islam was part of the opening of the Islamic wing, and when Susie asked me if I would speak, she was asking if I could talk about Islam, and I said I really couldn't speak about all of Islam, but that I would be very interested in talking about the beginning, more than anything else, of the emergence of Islam, because we so often think of Islam as the other, totally different in its traditions, different in its ideas, something very strange to us. And what I'm going to try to show you tonight is that, as with all traditions, things emerge from one pattern and move into another and that the Islamic world in its first generation conquers my Byzantines and, <laughs> and absorbs many of their traditions, which include not only Christian but also Jewish traditions of the region. So in answer to the request that I got when you, I was asked to speak, I'm going to show you where we are that we're talking about as we start. And we are actually talking about the Eastern Mediterranean, this area here, which from the beginning of the classical world is involved in the trade routes of the Mediterranean, and thus most standard maps like this one show you the territory that was originally the Roman Empire, and which in the mid-sixth century is still in its own mind the Roman Empire because my Byzantines, in their own minds, are the empire of the Romans 
when their capital is moved from the Rome in Italy that we know to the new Rome, Constantinople, the ca new capital of the empire, transferred as if Washington, D.C. was moved to San Francisco to move it closer to the major needs of the empire, the wealth of the goods on the eastern Mediterranean edge, and the armies of the Persians that had to be opposed. And so Constantin o Rome is here, and the capital is simply moved here to the city that you know now as Istanbul, which itself is a corruption of the Greek to the city. And for a 1,000 years, from the 330s to 1453, when the Ottoman Turks take the city, this is an empire that is a major force in political life, in merchant life, and in the development of both Christian and, to a surprising degree, Jewish traditions. So I would prefer that you think of the world in a larger way, that you recognize O Rome and Constantinople, and Justinian, who will build the great church we'll look at in a moment, but that you think that this core of the empire goes down the Red Sea to India for silks and for white gold, pepper, and that in the fourth century, the coins in gold minted in Constantinople provide the model for the coins made in Sri Lanka a, so a great source of the pepper, and that the wealth of New Rome is largely driven by the oil of its period, which was silk, and that the silk comes from the Far East, largely Chinese lands, often across northern routes through Central Asia, but we're going to be looking at the southern trade route more today because it's along that southern trade route in Mecca and Medina that the prophet will emerge and Islam will develop. And so it is not something outside of anything anyone knows. It's actually a major site, not necessarily always those towns, but that Red Sea in the trade routes. And we have text by a man named Cosmos Indicaplustes, Cosmos of India, about sailing down the Red Sea as essentially a spy for Justinian's predecessor trying to guarantee control of this for Constantinople and that empire that circles the Mediterranean. And he describes how he sees the bases of lost statues and the bases have inscriptions in Greek. And we know that Oxum, here almost at the mouth of the Red Sea, in the fourth century is converted to Christianity. So the military reach, the trade route reaches, bring that southern end of the Red Sea into the larger political sphere, religious sphere, that goes around the Mediterranean. And in the fifth century, in the sixth century, the emperors in Constantinople, the Roman emperors of New Rome, provide ships that take the soldiers from Aksum across to Yemen. And the Yemen that we know today that is such a frightening place is not necessarily enthusiastically, but certainly forcefully converted to Christianity. And the largest Christian basilica outside of the Mediterranean is thought to have been built in Sana'a. And according to texts that survive, people with mosaics were sent from Constantinople here to decorate the great church there. All of this is not because people love to do good, it's to get to the silks and the spices. And if you look carefully at this Chinese figure from a Chinese tomb, you'll see warriors and beasts that you could as easily seen in Greece. We don't know what people think of these trade routes, we don't know how often they understand the images, but that silk that's in the tunic definitely could have been sold in Constantinople. And it is Constantinople under Justinian that builds the great church of Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom. This church at its peak is three times the height of the greatest Gothic cathedral. 
It is, if any of you have ever been into it, you enter this huge, huge space that is almost totally overwhelming. And from when it is built in the sixth century by Justinian's scholars from what are in very much um, a type of university environment until 1453 when the city falls to the Ottoman Turks, it is the greatest church of the Christian world, of a world that is increasingly within the Christian communities divided between the Orthodox of the East and the Roman, what will become the Roman Catholics of old Rome. But at this moment, they're all one major church. And when it is transformed from the Church of Holy Wisdom, it is made into the Victory Mosque of Mehmet the Conqueror who takes Constantinople for the Ottoman Turks. And as we'll see in the talk, he then establishes a tradition of a mosque type that is shaped on this model and that will identify Ottoman conquest wherever the Ottoman Empire moves in the 500 years of its regime. In the distance, you see another 6th century church of Hagia Irene, which is now within the grounds of the Ottoman uh, Palace of the Top Kapi. But these secondary buildings are as important for us today as we look at Byzantium and Islam, because these are the burial sites of a number of the great Ottoman sultans. So this is a burial church for the most elite of, not a burial church, I apologize, a burial mosque for the most elite of the empire. It is the victory mosque of the Ottomans. For those people who are Orthodox, it remains today the great church of the Orthodox world. And in that is a continuing push me, pull me legally right at this moment. It's a museum. When Ataturk replaced the Ottoman Empire with the Republic of Turkey, one of the things he did was to turn it into a museum and to allow it to be studied by a body of scholars largely based um, in the United States. And the image we get oh, out of the idea of the conquest and the collapse of the tradition before is one that you see wonderfully evoked in this drawing, which is a study for a tapestry that was done in the 16th century in the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, the most famous, the Justinian of the, of the Ottoman world. And you see just Suleiman on his horse passing the Hippodrome, which was the great race course of the Byzantine Empire. The four horses of San Marco were looted from here in the Fourth Crusade past Hagia Sophia, past a mosque, and they are headed to the burial mosque, the Fatih Mosque of Mehmet the Conqueror. And it's the sense of one empire being replaced by another and a transition that becomes even more poignant in an inscription in this Byzantine Greek manuscript at the Metropolitan Museum that says that in 1454, three year, 1554, Three years before the end of Suleiman's reign, um, a man was accused of having taken the name of the prophet in vain, and he is beheaded in the Hippodrome that we see here. So the empires change, the world changes, but there are wonderful and important areas of continuity and transition. And when we did Byzantium and Islam, what we were seeking to show you was how between the 7th and the 9th century, one empire begins and another one ends, but all that is part of it doesn't end. So we know what cities would have looked like in the 6th, the 7th century in the Eastern Mediterranean from works like this, which is a great floor mosaic that all of you can go look at anytime you would like at Yale, because it's just been restored for our exhibition and installed in the new Yale Art Museum. And it shows you the cities of Alexandria and Memphis on the trade routes that go to Jarash in Jordan, which where this church was um, erected, another of the great cities of the classical trade routes, 
which continues to flourish in the Roman rule from Constantinople and even into the first generations of Islamic rule. And you see walls surrounding each city, buildings within them, colonnaded streets suggested by the columns that you see here, curtains hanging in doors, trees, fruiting trees, so the, the prosperity of plentiful plant life, often grapevines coming from pots, here are the vines, which start, as you all probably know, with Dionysus, so a god who precedes any of the Christian uh, world, and then a very handsome inscription saying how nice the bishop was to have this floor laid in the church. And we will see all of these elements continuing in ways that are transformed, but not eliminated. And if you went to Ravenna, north of Rome, um, the capital in the period of Justinian of the Western Roman Empire, you see the same walls and buildings within them. So while it is a palace, it's not our idea of Buckingham Palace, one big building, but a number of buildings for specific uses, which will continue in the Islamic period. And these huge curtains, which we're very excited at the Met because in Byzantium Islam, it turned out we had one of those curtains um, covered with hunting scenes and figures who are amuletic and protective and ours came from a burial in Egypt where the body that had been fully dressed is then wrapped in bigger fabrics and they're discovered in the late 19th century and change how we think of this world and are continuing as we'll see to change it. And that world of the floor from Jaras does not go away when in the seventh century the armies of the prophet emerge from Mecca and Medina and go up the trade routes that they have long known to the wealth of the Mediterranean. And the way we know that it doesn't automatically change are mosaic floors like this in modern Jordan, because this is from the eighth and ninth century. And you still have buildings that look much like those we've been looking at, trees, and the name of the town, Nicopolis, is still in Greek. And we know that in these, this first century of occupation by Islamic forces, that when the Umayyads who ruled the area, the first dynasty of Muslim um, conquerors, try to strike coins that are theirs, nobody will take them. So they have to do coins in the first generation that look Byzantine, but not quite Byzantine, because that's all they can get people to accept um, in exchange for pay. But some things do change and change dramatically. And this floor is a wonderful example of one of the great changes. It's happening in the newly arrived faith of Islam and in the existing faith of Christianity in the region. And it's a question of how much should one use images in the process of venerating your god. And in the Byzantine world, it's called the iconoclastic controversy, a great debate over the propriety of images. And in the Islamic world, it is matched by what will be acceptable to this new religion. And in some way, this church floor is caught up in that fight. Because here, you have ronceaux of plant shapes. And while you have to look a moment, you'll see the head of an animal and his forelegs and a spear, and actually they're little bits of blood. And what that once was, was a traditional upper class, what you do when you have a lovely weekend, you go out and hunt. Um, and if you're rich enough, you hunt with better gear, and you put it in your houses, and you put it in your churches, and it reflects wealth and prosperity. But someone has made it be changed, and the animal has become a giant cone of white with kind of tree and flower forms in it. And even in my exhibition a year ago, we had equally great scholars arguing whether this was a local Muslim ruler, because there are a variety of churches with this type of change, and several synagogues. So is it the new Muslim ruler who is super observant 
and everybody is taking out the parts that are perhaps objectionable. These are not brutally removed. These are very carefully removed and relayed. Or is it a reaction to the Christian and Jewish communities of statements that both are too involved in the classical past and that they should be breaking with the traditions which they are learning in school? Because this is a world of academic education very much like ours. And every school child, no matter what their faith, if they are in the right social bracket, going to the right schools, reads Homer. They learn about Dionysus. One of the most popular stories is Dionysus' conquest of India because it goes with Alexander the Great. And Alexandria in Egypt is a city founded by Alexander the Great. We always underestimate the complexity of the people living in areas. But if we went around this room and asked everybody where their great-grandparents were from, we would not all be from the same place. And the Eastern Mediterranean, or all the world, was equally interwoven with peoples. And one of the ones who have a major effect, we believe, on the rise of Islam are Arabs who are already part of the social structure of the Byzantine Empire. These are the Ghassanid Arabs, and they are the border forces of the Byzantine state. The Lakhmid Arabs are the border, state, border forces of the Persians. And they both groups convert to the religions of the dominant communities that they serve. And both groups, at the upper levels, get educated like everybody else. They have nice titles, like general, given to them by the Byzantine emperor, the Persian rulers. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, what most of them do is they join a Christian community that is not the church that builds Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, but a church that we would now call Miaphysite, which means that in defining the nature of Christ, they see him as only God and not man. And thus, it's kind of like thinking of Protestants versus Catholics in terms of debates. And one of the places that we know that they most liked to go on pilgrimage was to Mount Nebo, where Moses saw the Holy Land and was not allowed to enter it. And these are two church floors from sites that have been excavated there by, of all things, the Franciscans. And the bottom one is thought to show some of these Arabs, perhaps a Nubian here, uh, with the exotic trade goods like an ostrich, doing what polite up upscale people do, hunt exotic animals. And in this space, we have what is argued to be the earliest Arabic inscription in a Christian church, so that when you look at this world and see a language, you cannot automatically say it goes with this specific, specific group of people. The name on the right is Saolus, Sa and he we know is a deacon in the church because he gave lots of things, so his name pops up on a, a variety of things. Um, we're looking at people that we don't think of uh, when we say, here's who goes to a church. And in the same way, <clears throat> we have numerous synagogue floors, not only in the Eastern Mediterranean, but this one, which I love, which is fr from Haman Leaf in Tunisia. And Tunisia is going to show up several times in this talk. When it was found, because a French colonel was having people dig a garden for him behind his residence, it was first thought to be a Christian church. And only when the inscription, which is in Latin, the official language of the empire, um, was sent to scholars again around the turn of the 20th century, did they recognize that Sancta Synagoga was the popular, proper name for a Jewish synagogue at that time, and that these menorahs, which are here and here, would also emphasize that it is a Jewish house of worship. You can see these anytime you like by going to the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And in about a year, we'll have an article out on why Brooklyn would get the floor mosaics from Haman Leaf. Every other decoration in this could be in a church, it could be in a palace, it could be in a synagogue, 
It could be anywhere that properly educated people are living in the, the Byzantine Empire and showing off to each other. So it's like the clothes you were wearing would be recognized if you were picked up this moment and dropped in London. These type of mosaics are popular all over the sphere of the Roman Byzantine Empire. And its wealth is phenomenal. So <laughs> this is the Empress Theodora. And the image of Justinian that I opened with, this is on one side of a church in Ravenna, and Theodora, Justinian and his retinue are on the other side. And you would think that they ought to be religious images because each is bringing a gift to the church, but of course they are more significantly political statements. Justinian has just reconquered this part of the empire from one of these other Christian communities and he is essentially saying in these matched images, look at the wealth we bring you, look at the power we bring you, get in line and join our church and give up on the one you've got. We are the right thing to belong to. And these have survived. So this is our image of what she would have worn going into a service in Hagia Sophia. A fountain out front whose exact use we don't know, but it certainly relates what, to the water in front of mosque that, will be, that you use to cleanse yourself before you go to prayer. Three magi on her robe and the elaborate silks that drive the wealth of the empire. And when you look more closely at the silks, you see this pattern on one of the ladies in waiting. And it's almost the same as these overlapping two squares that form an eight-pointed star that is on another of the textiles in the Metz collections found in Egypt. And if you look, you have a grapevines pot. And grapevines go and go and group and come and come and come back out to another uh, pot at the other end. So the positive ambiance of grapevines that goes back into probably before our concept of classical antiquity. On these two works from the same world, but this tile is a millennium later, and it is from the Islamic world in Spain, and you still have those motifs. Plants on interlocking squares, forming geometric patterns, but if you look at the new ads in the New York Times today for the designer Celine, you'll see that what in the Islamic world they become a continuum and the geometry becomes the dominant thing and we think of them as something very different. But they emerge from a tradition that we have known from the beginning of the classical world. It's just that Islam, much more than Christianity or Judaism will put an exceptionally lovely priority on the use of geometry to explain the holy. And we in the Christian world in Hagia Sophia, if you enter it, you cannot understand the, the structure when you walk in, and that's deliberate. If you go into the mosques that emulate it, the structure is made like a giant crystal. So that is a way in which Islam takes ideas that are common and moves them in another direction. But as they do this, this is just so amazing to me. These silks were all in our show, Byzantium and Islam. They are all upscale, Byzantine good taste, quite possibly Christian good taste, but certainly not necessarily Islamic good taste, and yet they're all made into the ninth century and they may all have been woven in areas under the control of the new Umayyad and then Abbasid rulers that are building the power of the Islamic world. And you run from trellises with some type of little garden ornament or pineapple that everybody has, and they are kind of a simple silk to weave, to a man fighting lions, take your pick. He can be Samson, he can be David, he can be Hercules, we tend to call him Samson because the silk was found uh, wrapped around the body of a Catholic saint in Western Europe. And my favorite silks, there are a whole group of these. They are woven, we believe, in the city of Pan, Panopolis, 
which we would expect to be somewhere like in Greece, but it's actually way down the Nile toward Nubia and is now called Akmim. And it was always a city of great importance for weaving. And you see what all of you gentlemen would be doing in that period. You're out hunting on your nice horse. You have your falcon and your falcon lure. And you have your attendants who are in a marsh spearing cranes, which is a very popular, so popular, in fact, that poems are written about it. So you are looking at the world of the affluent. And apparently, the affluent Muslims of the first generation were perfectly happy to wear what the affluent Byzantines had worn before. And possibly, this wonderful silk, it's the finest silk from the Byzantine world to survive, which was found inside of a box in the Vatican about 1900. And it's important to remember, most of what we know about this material is less than 200 years old, even though it was made a millennium and a half ago, or a millennium ago. And here you have the Annunciation by the Archangel to the Virgin. So maybe the three Magi were also woven. It's exceptionally beautiful. Maybe it was woven in Constantinople, but if it wasn't, it was probably woven in Syria or Egypt, and both are under Islamic control by this period. So somebody is willing to keep having motifs made that do not object to figures. And we don't yet fully understand how to explain that. And then adding to the complexity of the question are these three rags, which are all that survive of a silk uncovered again in one of these graves in Egypt and recognized to be the first example of an Islamic tradition of silk that's called taraz. And it's where if I'm the governor of New York, I have fabrics woven and they say, Helen Evans, governor of New York, uh, ordered this. And then I give it to those people that visit me who are the most important, and they go back and they wear it to show that they have had the honor of meeting me. It's like a photograph now. Um, every time you meet an important dignitary, somebody takes a picture of you for you to take home. The Taraz tradition, which goes on throughout most of the history of Islam's, first example is thought, if you put the rags back together as the Victoria and Albert tried to do, you get this textile. And the patterns on it are thought to be Central Asian, maybe more than Mediterranean, although these patterns are not that different from these patterns. And this silk with the elephant on it, which I would tell you look like it ought to have been woven in China, is actually um, inscribed saying it was made in Constantinople and was a gift from the Byzantine emperor into the court of Charlemagne in such a way that it's in his tomb in Aachen in Germany. So what is Byzantine, what is Islamic, is something that we're doing more and more scientific testing on, which leads us to know that the yellow in this dye is from a plant that grows in Central Asia. So maybe this was woven in Central Asia, or maybe they exported the dye to the Mediterranean. And the inscription, which is embroidery, not woven, so it doesn't tell us where the silk was made, says that it was for Marwan, whom we believe was the ruler in the middle of the 8th century, middle of the, yes, middle of the 8th century, who ruled, as the inscription says, in Ifriq, and Ifriq is Tunisia. So the Hamanli synagogue floor is followed by elaborate silks like this in the first generations of Islamic rule, and there is an interweaving, maybe for no other reason than you have to use the weavers you've got, whatever their religion. But our tendency, even in the title of my talk, Byzantium, Islam, suggests that they're either ors, and there is in fact an immense amount of interweaving. So that looking at this image, you would think I'm going to show you a Muslim ruler sitting cross-legged with his wife and a smaller person who is actually his daughter. In fact, he's a Christian. He's an Armenian. He is Gagid of Kars, and he is a ruler in a part of eastern Turkey today that is under the lordship of an Islamic state 
but he has a small kingdom within it that pays tribute to the Muslim rulers. And he, he and his daughter, whom we assume is his heir, have taraz visible on the sleeves, so they are showing their connection to the Muslim ruler that they are under. But the manuscript that it is in is a Christian gospel book written in Armenian. So many things taken out of context we may often misunderstand, and we don't fully understand how these people negotiate between cultures. And that applies to, to Greeks and Jews and Syrians. They're all moving back and forth between cultures. And that probably immensely influenced the first generation of the building of religious sites by Islam, because it has to convince you, as it conquers you, that it is worthy of respect and it is capable of matching the Byzantine Empire, the Hagia Sophia, that it has just replaced. And the first of these monuments is, of course, the Dome of the Rock, built in Jerusalem on the site of the Second Temple, a site connected to Abraham, um, a wonderful octagonal building that is not a mosque, but a religious monument of a holy site. And it is argued rather convincingly that in its first generations, it is not um, built just because the prophet ascended to heaven from that site, but because the Umayyads who control the Mediterranean coast but have rivals toward Mecca and Medina and on down the Red Sea are attempting to create a new Mecca, that you would go here rather than to Mecca on the annual pilgrimage of the Hajj. And you have, you can see, this is the Dome of the Rock, and this is the dome of the Christian Church of the Holy Sepulchre, so you're building an answer to it. And the Holy Sepulchre you see in Israel today is a relatively small building. It once had a huge basilica extending from it that was torn down in later centuries. Um, so it would have been a, this huge monumental building, and the new faith of Islam is answering it with its building and filling its interior, and probably originally its exterior, with extremely elaborate mosaics with inscriptions located differently in a different language, but the same interest in trees that we saw in the floor of mosaic in the church in Jiraj. And within 15 years of the building of the site of the Holy Sepulchre in Damascus, Syria, the Umayyads build their great political statement, a giant version of the portrait of the Theodora and Justinian, a Friday mosque where within Islam and particularly in the earlier centuries, every Muslim in the city was to come on Friday and have what was essentially a combination of a sermon and a political broadsheet by the ruler of what was happening. So this is built to absorb all the Muslims in a city which was a very big city. So all these buildings around this square are, would have been there in another form under the Umayyads. It is not a city that is devastated. Many of these cities are not devastated when the transfer of power occurs. The man who is the governor of the region for the state in Constantinople is supposed to have handed over the keys to the city to the Umayyads, and the Umayyads took rule, and they started paying their taxes to the Umayyads instead of paying them to Constantinople. That man is important in the Byzantine world because his grandson is St. John of Damascus, and that is the scholar theologian who writes the greatest defense of the use of images for religious veneration. And part of the reason he is free to write in defense of icons is that his father was the chief, um, tr well, the treasurer, essentially, for the Umayyads in Damascus, and that their family is a prominent family in the region. And in fact, they are Arabs. They are the Mansur family. Um, St. John is such a seminal figure in Byzantine art that we tend to think he ought to be Greek or 
something in that order, but he is in fact of this world. And if you look carefully, you can see that this is kind of shiny. And that's because you're looking at a sheer wall of gold mosaics. And once again, you have the things we've been looking at, trees and buildings, maybe paradise scenes, things to welcome you through. And according to tradition, as in Yemen, uh, mosaic workers and Thessarai were sent from Constantinople to decorate this church, so this mosque. I'm going to do that all evening. And when you, and when you look at details here from the great mosque, you can see how they relate to this lovely little building with these same cascades of water. And this is from the, a floor of the great palace in Constantinople, or the fountain and curling scrolls of a wall outside of a church um, in Greece that I hope is going to be in the exhibition that should eventually manage to open in Washington, D.C. that was supposed to open right as our government shut down on Byzantine art in Greece. It's not just the buildings and it's not just regular life. This interconnection, we believe, extends into the most holy of Christian, Jewish, Muslim text, the Torah, the Bible, the Gospels, the Quran. So on the upper left, you're seeing what doesn't look like a gospel to you because it's written in Pacheta, the language of the Syrian Christians, and particularly those under the Persians because they're the legal Christian language in Persia. And what's significant is that this community reaches all the way to India. That when the Persians replace the Byzantines in Yemen, they take over the church that was built with the armies of Byzantium. And you read the text as you read the Torah and as you read the Quran, this direction while we're used to reading that direction. And it is argued by some scholars that Christian Syriac scribes helped write down the first Qurans because the Quran begins as a verbal tradition. The prophet speaks. His faithful listeners hear, remember, and repeat, which of course leads to several different versions of the same thing. And in these first centuries of Islam, first there's a fight over whether the Quran should be written down, and then secondly, which is the right version. And many of the earliest ones look like this. They're vertical. They look like a page you and I could look at. They have decorations between the chapters, the surahs, that can be paralleled in Byzantine text. And so it is possible that these Christian Arabs, Syriac Christians, not Orthodox in Constantinople or Rome's form, but decided definitively Christian, helped develop the Quran as a written form. And it is certain that this type of Quran then influences some of the earliest copies that survive of Jewish texts. And this is the first Gaster Bible on the right, named, of course, for the man that collected it, and in the British Library. And the style of the Hebrew relates to the style of contemporary Arabic, and the decorations can go between Qurans, Bibles, Gospels, Torahs. They're all, in some way, linked together. And conceivably, the scribes knew each other more than we would think they did. And certainly, again, keeping up with the Joneses, the most elegant of the Qurans, the blue Quran with written in gold that comes from Karawan, again in Tunisia, which in this period is a great intellectual center, is almost certainly an effort to keep up with these gorgeous gospel books written in the Byzantine Empire on vellum that has been dyed purple and then written on in gold and silver. And I was asking when we worked on Byzantium and Islam, a Professor Stephen Fine from Yeshiva University, if, if he could find references to Torahs written that elegantly. I just can't believe that if two religions are fighting out who can do the fanciest version of their text, that it's only two of the three. I'm certain somewhere there was a third, um, but he has not found it for me yet. And this type 
of elaboration. Continues on in science. The plants that you see on the upper left are from a text by Dioscorides, a man in the first century AD who wrote this exceptional herbal of the uses of plants and pl uh, some minerals. In the seventh century, the copy that we had in Byzantium and Islam rearranges their order so it's alphabetically, so you can find it more easily. And in the 13th century at the lower right, a Christian scribe writing in and around Baghdad turns Dioscorides into a Muslim. He sits him as if he is a scholar in the classical tradition, which is the pose that's then given to the Christian evangelist and is here given to him, but he's wearing a turban. And we know that this doubles page echoes some gospels in the East Christian world where the, where the evangelists are bringing their gospels to show Christ. What's interesting to me is that it's quite possible that many of these scientists of what we think of as the Islamic world were in fact Christians within that world because many of the Christian communities by the 8th century are writing in Arabic. It's the same way as Jewish communities in America often write in English. It's not a giving up of your religion, it's a dealing with the reality of where you live. And in my, three of my favorite pieces, you've got three little pot-bellied ivory containers, and only the one on the upper left has a cross on it, so we can be certain that it is for Christian use. And the one in the middle, which has a pot at the very bottom and the world's most gigantic um, scrolling vine growing out of it, is in the Islamic Museum in Berlin, but that seems to have as much to do with what the people returning the loot after the Second World War thought it should go to as any evidence that it would be Muslim as opposed to Christian Islamic states as opposed to um, Byzantine. And at the upper right one in the VNA that is thought to be Islamic because the bird that's barely visible there may or may not have an Arabic inscription on him. We just don't know. I can't look at you and identify your religions. I'm sure if I got up close, some people are wearing something that would help me, but sitting from here, you are all affluent people in Connecticut. And that seems to, in a way, be what we should be thinking of this world as, not people that walk down the street saying, buy their wardrobe, I am this. I'm sure there were people that did do that, but that the great bulk of people were citizens of the state. And at the end, of the Islamic era, of the Umayyad Islamic era, we get one of our best enigmas. Um, this building complex here is Mashata. And right now it's right at the edge of the Amman airport um, in the area for the large packing buildings. And you still have the square outline that we've seen, towers, and a number of buildings in the complex of which the reception hall has the most of it standing. If you're in Berlin, you see much of it, all of this, which came from right there, um, which was moved to Berlin at the beginning of the 20th century when it was thought to be a Persian castle. Then it became an early Umayyad palace, and it may now be, in fact, a slightly later one. When we went to this side of the place, <laughs> Um, the government of Jordan agreed to lend us these three stones, which, as you can see, came from an equally elaborately par carved part of the welcoming facade. This is what you saw as you approached the place. On this side, you have animals. On this side, you have no animals. We don't quite know why. We know that this site is supposed to be on the way to Mecca and it was a pilgrimage stop, or at least it's thought to have been, and yet inside of this rather Persian-style palace, there were a number of decidedly undressed ladies carved in stone that welcomed you as you came into the audience hall. This is the front and one side of the one that survives in Jordan. 
if you look at it and think of anything, you have to think of a dancing menad from a Dionysian revelry. And these stones on the front have pots, and all these vines are grapevines. And what did it mean to the man who had it carved? Was it just good decoration? Did he actually approve of these ladies in the classical idea? Or are they something else entirely? It's the type of questions that even now we are asking. And we're asking in part because the world begins to change as the Umayyads are replaced by the Abbasids. The world of the Umayyads, the men who come out of Mecca and Medina, up the Red Sea, taking the entire coast, not taking Constantinople, although they send a number of armies at it, would have known these people. This little ivory is supposed to be representing St. Mark, whom we think of with Venice in Italy, but he is the first bishop of Alexandria. And if you are a Coptic Christian, a Christian of the Egyptian church, you believe that Mark is surrounded by the first 35 bishops who follow him as the head of the Coptic church. I, on the other hand, will tell you these people are dressed like people going to the White House um, in the uniforms of the bureaucracy. And I love it because there's the wall of the city and the towers and the houses that we've seen uninhabited. And these are all the people leaning out of the windows, the lively, vivid life that we don't get when we look at the archaeological ruins. And in this world to which the people from Mecca and Medina would not have looked very different, you suddenly get another group of people. The Abbasids, who are also early Muslims, don't conquer the Mediterranean first. They go up through areas that we think of as Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kurdistan, Iraq, Iran, and they build their own empire, which then reaches the Mediterranean and takes over from the Umayyads. And this gentleman with his giant Dolly Parton hairdo and slanted eyes was found about 15 years ago, so we've never known figures like this before, in the ruins of a palace at Aqaba in Jordan on the Red Sea uh, in an audience hall that they went back and re, uh, were evac excavating again uh, you know, a half century after it had been done before. And there are decorations for either furniture or boxes. They're about this size. And they would have arrived and not looked like anybody you knew. They could, in fact, have been Central Asian or even Chinese. And when the Abbasids take over the state, they set up their capital not in an existing, thriving commercial site like Damascus, as the Umayyads did. They build their own capital, and we know it as Baghdad, and we know it regularly from Iraq. But in the process of building Baghdad, which is actually laid out by the son of a Chinese monk, um, we, they build another cap capital briefly inhabited that is a ruin and that is Samara, and these pieces come from Samara, which is way into the desert. And Samara has a very different style. You can trace elements of it to the Mediterranean. We call it the beveled style because it's hard to tell which part of any of these is supposed to be the foreground and the background. It's kind of a perpetual pattern. And the Mosque of Samara, is a large rectangle with a huge open courtyard. So not like the mosque in Damascus at all, not like the Dome of the Rock. And its minaret looks like a ziggurat and is probably an effort to bring the locals in that region into an understanding of who has conquered them. And what happens to Baghdad that makes it so exciting to me and the Abbasids is one, they build incredibly, wonderfully beautiful um, metalwork. And this is one of the earliest examples to survive with an Akufic inscription by um, the maker of um, the work that suggests it was made in Basra in Iraq. Oops. Um, sorry. 
we're almost through. Um, but they also send people to rule Egypt. So the Abbasids replace the Umayyads, and in replacing the Umayyads, in Egypt they send a man named Ibn Tulun to be the ruler of all of their territories in Egypt, and Ibn Tulun decides that that's kind of a waste of his time, and he establishes his own independent Muslim Egypt. And so when you read about Islamic art that's called Tulunid, it's the art of his dynasty. He may have looked like this figure, because we know his parents were bought in the slave market in Bukhara. And then as a military slave, he takes over Egypt with its ties back in terms of classical world to Alexandria the Great, Alexander and Alexandria the Great, and he builds the great mosque of Ibn Tulun. And that mosque is now in Cairo, but when he built it, Cairo hadn't been conceived of, and it was a town that he established to be his capital and his minaret, minus the part that's new and late, is an echo of the ziggurat here, and you have this huge open courtyard, and I think it's one of the most beautiful enclosures of volume in the world, and I absolutely never see anybody inside of it, perhaps because it's in a first-class slum. When we begin, this is one of my last two slides, when we begin at the end of the 20th, 19th century to seriously study the Orient, we are looking in many cases for either Moses or Jesus because Homer has been found and we've got to keep up with um, the proof that the Iliad is real. And we look at what we now call Orientalism, and we, the artists that paint this exotic East, this other, David Roberts did this image. It shows you Cairo. And when we look at it, we think this is Islam, and Islam is a simple unit. But if you are looking at the layers of history that go with essentially the last millennium and a half, you would know that Ibn Tulun is somewhere right about here, and this is another Conqueror's Friday Mosque. And this is not a native Muslim Egyptian community or even an Arab Egyptian community that conquered in the seventh century. This is the citadel of Cairo, right at the edge of the old cemetery, which is filled with Mamluk, another dynasty that conquered the area, um, tombs. And beside the Nam Mamluk tombs rises this protective wall still, and in its center, is the Friday Mosque, and if you look at it, you should think of Hagia Sophia. It is a statement of Ottoman conquest. And this is the citadel built by Selim I, the father of Suleiman, in 1517, when he essentially regains for the Ottomans all the territory that we saw on the first map as belonging to Justinian. And every place that is fighting right this moment across North Africa and up the Eastern Mediterranean and down to Yemen was part of the sphere that was Byzantine connected, classical before that, and then transformed by the advent of the rise of Islam. So Islam is woven into it, and in my last slide, so that when you look at the Muslim world, which we tend to think of as being to the Far East. Remember that as you look at the mosque, the great mosque in Mecca, the site of the Hajj, that you're looking at a tradition that is decidedly non-Ottoman, so decidedly non-Ottoman that the Turks complained about the Saudis in the last few years to a world court because they tore down some Ottoman period buildings because they really don't like the Ottomans. Um, and that the Kaaba, which also is associated with Abraham, in this case Abraham and Ishmael, was a pagan site long before, quite possibly even Judaism, but certainly before Christianity and Islam, and that when the prophet returns to the city and cleans out those things that he considers inappropriately pagan and essentially makes it a Muslim site, one of the things that he leaves that is no longer there is an icon of the virgin and child. 
these cultures of the three religions that come from the book don't always like each other, but they are always interwoven. And this is a generation where we're looking at all of the assumptions of 100 years ago again and finding, I think, very exciting new ways to think about it. Um, I am going to quit. I've had a wonderful time speaking to you tonight. I appreciate your attention. I promise I'd answer questions, and I'm happy to do it. You've got to shut me up. I'm very good at talking forever. Yes. <laughs> The, the Kabbalah is associated with Abraham and Ishmael in some traditions. What is that? What is the Kabbalah? It's that great big black rock in the middle of the mosque in Mecca. Kabbalah, keep, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing it. Kibla. What have I done to it? So, I'm sorry, I've lost the word and I've been mispronouncing it. It's the most sacred place in Islam. You go on the Hajj to pray before it. Jade? It's now part of the Muslim tradition, but just like the Dome of the Rock, the Dome of the Rock is on top of earlier traditions. The Great Mosque in Damascus is on top of both Christian and classical religious sites. It, it's an interesting thing that almost every really significant uh, religious site of any religion that's built as a triumph over whoever was ruling in the spot before them is on top of a place that was sacred before they arrived. Um, because, I mean, so beautiful mosaics and so built, but most of these findings were not necessarily within Muslim area per se or within the confines of this very modern state of Israel. So my question basically is, if you take a look at, look at the Holy Sepulcher and the Dome of the Rock, which is built on top of the Temple Mount, how much of this ongoing archaeological Well, they're both strongly there. The, 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 the reality is we, it, it's, it's always irritating. Um, I have Byzantium, which is a secular state, and Islam, which is a religion. I ought to be able to say something that Byzantium and what? The Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Mamluks, the Ottomans, so we simplify it to Muslims. Um, the ruling entity in the area that is under the Romans called Greater Syria and includes Jerusalem, um, is always first the classical god and then the Christian god and then the Muslim rulers. How the, the question you may be asking is how much did they actually build there that survived to be found? And that's a more interesting problematic issue because <laughs> Everybody builds something they are really nice once, and then they go build better things where they live for every religion that's there. Um, but you can find elements of every one. The, the Muslim and the Christian, we tend to call it field archaeology because they're popping above the ground more. But within the last month, they found a gold menorah, that uh, little amulet. But it's an interesting thing because it suggests wealth. It, every, the thing that's really... I, I cannot tell you this enough. All of the questions we're asking are millennium, two millennium, even three millennium old. Scientific research began in the mid-19th century, and it began with, a, with opinions. This is what we're going to find. If I'm a good Roman Catholic, I'm going to find things that show the Eucharist. If I'm a good Protestant, 
I'm going to show that before Rome, Christians never painted anything. Um, if I'm Jewish, I'm going to find that we were better than the Protestants, but we were more Protestant than Catholic. That's what the th and, and we all taught in either France, Germany, Italy, or England. Um, and so we never talked to any of the people that lived in the area. And we went in to prove what we knew was right. So in the last 20 years, there was an earthquake in Egypt and one of the nice white walled, utterly undecorated Coptic churches lost all the white paint on it and it's riotously covered with quite, quite fantastic um, people and buildings. And it looks pretty much like what we know was built in Constantinople. We made what we wanted and now what we're trying to do is sort it out. It means a recognition of, of the greater presence of a number of communities. It means, in terms of Judaism, one of the great changes is the synagogues appear to have been really quite heavily decorated and often with human figures. And in 1900, you would never have been able to say that. Um, and I'm greatly admiring Stephen Fine for having said it for me. <laughs> he carried Yeshiva University behind him. Um, we are, in the next 50 years, going to have much of this be substantiated, but a lot of it is going to change. And it's really exciting to look at, and the trade routes are going to have a lot to do with it. Um, we're going to find Christians and Jews all the way into India, because Yemen is actually probably Jewish when they are converted forcefully by the Ethiopians to Orthodox Christianity, and still largely Jewish when the Persians make them become um, Syrian Christians. Can I confuse anybody else? <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, and thank you very much for having such a wonderful series.